Hello, everyone. I'm Jim Garrison. I want to welcome you to this session of Humanity Rising as we complete today a five-day program on glyphosate and the pervasive nature of this poison in the human and planetary uh, ecology. As we conclude, I want to juxtapose two realities that I think characterize our world. As many of you may have seen in the news, the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists this week have pushed the atomic clock to 90 seconds to midnight. And not since the uh, Bulletin of Atomic Scientists was founded by Albert Einstein and a number of nuclear weapons scientists back in 1945 has the doomsday clock, as they've come to call it, been so close to midnight. Normally, it's two to three minutes out, but this week, they said we are now at a danger zone that can only be measured in seconds. Obviously, the war in Ukraine uh, is uh, of utmost concern given the nuclear possibilities and increasing probabilities as the two superpowers square off. But more broadly, as the president of the uh, committee put it, is the general world situation, which, as we've seen this week, includes the pervasive use of glyphosate, which is so destructive uh, in the biology of all living beings in the soil and so forth. And that leads me to the other point that I want to juxtapose against this. And that is the extraordinary courage and clarity and commitment and fortitude of the panelists that we've had all week. This has been one of the most impactful programs we've ever had on Humanity Rising because the group that's been assembled has spared no detail in informing us of the dangers that we're in, and yet have embodied, each in their own way, the kind of courage and willingness to look the darkness right in the eye and still stand and win court cases against Monsanto and others, and just carry on in the nurturance of the human spirit in the face of extraordinary odds. This is who humanity rising is, my friends. And I just wanna honor uh, the integrity of the people that we've seen. And to make the point that as Carl Jung put it, we have you know all of us all the time to grapple with what he called the antinomial nature of reality. That sometimes you have two mutually exclusive realities that at every level contradict and conflict with one another. And yet, as we heard yesterday from Zach Bush, if you can expand your consciousness out widely enough, deeply enough into the ancient wisdoms, you can see that these antinomial realities have a fundamental interactivity that if pursued to the end, redeems the human soul and liberates the spirit. That's just an extraordinary possibility and illumination for us to carry as the world quite literally gets worse and worse and yet also better and better, faster and faster in our time. I just want to acknowledge the human spirit today and acknowledge the optimism and the possibility that naturally ensues when human beings, wherever they are, whatever they're up against, simply take a stand and endure. And through that endurance, bring a great light into the world. In that spirit, 
let us breathe together as we always do as we begin our sessions on humanity rising you'll hear the sound of a bell breathe in you'll hear the sound of another bell and breathe out for five and a half breaths in a minute bringing in five and a half liters of air thank you everyone uh, let us breathe together as one Thank you, everyone. Breathing is one is such an extraordinarily powerful way for us to illuminate the world. The breath animates all things. As Plotinus said, the whole universe breathes as one. And all of our antinomial realities, however diverse, however they contradict, are held in a breathing universe. That's the great mother. Now, it's my great pleasure to introduce my good friend, uh, Tom Eddington, who's put this panel together. You all know him, so I, I won't uh, repeat the introduction. But Tom, beautiful job this week, my friend. Uh, inspiration to all of us. I turn the program over to you. Thank you, Jim. And um, I... I'm looking forward to uh, to today's conversation as we wrap up the week. And, uh, you know, I, I particularly appreciated some of your opening comments today about uh, the journey that we were on this week and the uh, the messages that we heard. In particular, um, you know, when I think about uh, Zach Bush yesterday, when I asked him the question about resiliency, and uh, it's part of what I want to explore today with, uh, with our guests, Carrie, Kelly, and, and Michael, is how each of them have retained their resiliency during the, uh, the challenges and the struggles they've, they've been up against for the, uh, the last uh, several years now of, of their journey with uh, taking on Monsanto and glyphosate and, uh, and the world that, that we as a species have, uh, have created. Um, so let me just do a, a quick uh, introduction of, of each of our guests today. For those of you who are with us this week, you already know them, but uh, 
Carrie Gillum is an investigative journalist and author with uh, more than 30 years of experience covering food and agricultural policies and practices, including 17 years as a senior correspondent for Reuters International. Um, she's won several industry awards for her work. Uh, her first book, Whitewash, the story of wheat killer, cancer, and the corruption of science was released in October of 2017 and won the coveted Rachel Carson Book Award from the Society of Environmental Journalists as well as two other awards. Um, Carrie's second book, a legal thriller titled The Monsanto Papers, Deadly Secrets, Corporate Corruption, and One Man's Search for Justice was released in March of uh, 2021. Also joining us today is uh, Kelly Ryerson. Uh, Kelly's work at the inter is at the intersection of agriculture, nutrition, and health. She started a news site, Glyphosate Facts, which explores and explains how our chemical agricultural system has led to an explosion in chronic disease. She collaborates with scientists, doctors, farmers, and companies to better address agrochemical damage to our soil and bodies. Kelly has a BA from Dartmouth and an MBA from uh, the Stanford Graduate School of Business. And Michael Baum. Uh, Michael's a senior partner at the national plaintiff law firm Weisner Baum. Uh, based in Los Angeles. And for over 29 years, Michael was the managing partner of um, Bob Hedlund. Uh, under Michael's leadership, the firm has won billions of dollars in consumer fraud and product liability cases against some of the world's largest pharmaceutical and life sciences corporations, including Bayer, Eli Lilly, Forest Labs, GlaxoSmithKline, and Pfizer. And uh, certainly for this week, we focused on the uh, the $10.9 billion settlement with uh, with Monsanto. So Kelly, Michael, Carrie, thank you, as Jim already shared, for an extraordinary week and your contributions to uh, to help making this uh, um, an incredibly eye-opening and uh, impactful week. Uh, but more importantly, thank you for all the work you've been doing on behalf of humanity. Um, you know, each of you have suffered personal attacks against your reputation. Um, it's been, uh, uh, you know, certainly from my perspective, a, uh, a commitment of passion for humanity and the humanity, human race. And uh, I just want to honor and thank you for what each of you have done to, to try and make the world a better place. Um, and as I mentioned in my opening remarks, you know, something that uh, I, I asked Zach yesterday and I didn't get a chance to ask each of you in the uh, conversations this week is where do you get your personal resiliency? I mean, the attacks, the uh, the work, the all that you put into, into um, this topic in particular, what, what keeps you going? Um, and where does that resiliency and, and hopefulness for humanity come from? Who wants to go first? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like you volunteered. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I mean, people ask me that a lot, I guess. Um, I think there are many different factors. One, I'm a journalist. I'm trained to be a journalist. Journalists, um, you know, just it's the nature of the beast that you often are asking people uncomfortable questions or you're put into situations where, uh, you know, the people that you're questioning are not going to want to answer the question or are going to push back. And, and conflict maybe is is sort of just a part of the job. So I have a pretty thick skin. I've always had a pretty thick skin. Um, I had to grow a thicker skin uh, when dealing with Monsanto. I and, and there were times when I it was felt I was at a crossroads and I knew that it would be a lot easier to step back and to do something different and had opportunities to do something different. But I just, I don't know, I was compelled. I felt like, as you talked about, this is really important for humanity. There are a lot of different, you know, roles and issues and, and things that people <laughs> get involved in. And certainly talking about pesticides was not something that I imagined I would spend a good portion of my life doing. Um, but I do think it's, you know, it's one area where I have been fortunate to learn a lot and to be put into a position where I can tell others what I've learned and communicate that and share that. And so, you know, I have kids, I hope they have kids one day and they have kids and they have kids. And too many folks are suffering cancer, reproductive health problems, other diseases and, and issues, and pesticides are a big part of that. 
and glyphosate is the poster child, as I said earlier, for, for a lot of the problems that we see with the regulatory system, um, you know, and, and the lack of proper protections for human and environmental health. And so I think it's important to just keep going. So, that, you know, so I keep going. <laughs> Kelly, Michael. Yeah. I, I, I while I was muted, I said ladies first. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I like very similar to Carrie. Absolutely, never in my wildest dreams imagined that this is an area that I would end up focusing on. Um, pest pesticides didn't really even enter my consciousness until I became sick myself, um, due to just how toxic our food supply is. In fact, I was really, for years, was focused on space commercialization before Elon Musk, by the way. Um, and and just the beauty of exploring um, the universe and how you can make that accessible to all people. And having my own health crisis really converted my thinking back to, okay, well, what, what's going on in this planet and what's going on with this with our race and, and other species as well. And so... I, you know, what after my illness and coming and, and seeing the trial and just seeing how insanely corrupt our regulators are, I, you know, you hear about it, um, but I came from an extremely patriotic, relatively conservative family that wouldn't really second guess our regulators or our government very much. And, and so learning about just how entirely captured they are by corporate America is, is, was really eye-opening for me. So then I, so I, you know, in all of my work, I also probably every three to four months have a crisis where like, I just, you, it's so hard to get up and keep going because you just don't ever get really good news except for, you know, this, this trial. But other than that, if you are out there and you're working, you just don't get the feedback that normally would compel someone to keep on working um, towards a specific task. So I, for the same reasons in many ways as Carrie keeps on finding herself back on this subject, um, it, it I think there's a certain element that we've been chosen for whatever reason, like it or not, to be reporting on this. Michael? Um, it's, it's probably a number of things, but um, uh, there, there's a, a, a motto that we have at our office, which is uh, Margaret Mead quote is uh, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. I think that uh, each of the panelists here, I think Carrie, uh, Tom, Jim, uh, Kel Kelly are all uh, among that small group of thoughtful citizens that actually make a difference. And I'd like to be part of that group helping out. Um, some of it has to do with just uh, having sort of an idealistic view of uh, what the world could be if we didn't have corruption and didn't have toxins. And uh, having a license to practice law is kind of like having a, a license to like a gunslinger to go out and do something about it. So that's, I don't know if you've ever watched uh, uh, Paladin, which was uh, have gun will travel from the uh, uh, 60s, I think. I feel kind of like one of those people that has the uh, uh, the license to do something about it, and so I do. Well, something that uh, that that Zach Bush shared with us yesterday that was unexpected. He mentioned he recently re reached uh, met with the uh, um, the six of the senators on the Agricultural Committee. And three of them had never heard of glyphosate. Oh, come on. And um, that was both shocking and encouraging that he had an opportunity to educate um, three of the most you know, powerful people in Washington making decisions about how our agricultural money is spent. He also talked about being a speaker with the, the largest food companies in the world talking about glyphosate and helping educate them on, um, on the work that, uh, that he's doing, the science of, of glyphosate in particular. And for me, the, I was both shocked and uh, I found it to be incredibly encouraging and hopeful um, that um, those kinds of conversations are finally starting to happen. 
and that it it uh, it's going to take time, but there there's um, there's a possibility. So you know, Michael, the work you've done through the legal system, and uh, Kelly and Carrie, uh, the work you've done in educating the general public, and then uh, you've got you know scientists like Zach meeting with the EPA, meeting with industry leaders, meeting with the legislators. Um, it uh, it left me with a, a sense of hope that there's a real possibility that in the not too distant future, we may actually see see some significant change. I, I don't know how the, the three of you respond to that and where you get hope from, but for me personally, it was, it was very encouraging. I think that might be correct um, in terms of just feeling more hopeful about progress. Uh, you know, you've, Cory Booker and you've seen some other lawmakers introduce legislation or show support for reining in pesticide use in particular, uh, pesticides that are known to be particularly damaging to children. Uh, glyphosate's part of that. So I think you are seeing more awareness, but you, know, you also have the spectacle that occurred, when was that, Michael, 2019? 2017, 18, when, um, you know, the House held their uh, big hearing on stripping funding from the International Agency for Research on Cancer uh, at the behest of Monsanto and the agricultural industry. Our our House leadership in in Washington, D.C. held hearings to talk about taking away funding for cancer research and cancer science because the agrochemical industry didn't like it. I mean, you know, it was, me that it was, was that close, really. completely outrageous, right? So you you still have, I think, a, a vast majority of members in Congress who are so um, beholden to these big companies that I don't expect to see any significant change uh, anytime soon. An area that I felt hopeful about it is more of on the USDA side, even though now I, I definitely am less optimistic and idealistic than I was at one point. But the amount of funding that Tom Vilsack now has given to organic farming and specifically in a large grant to the Rodale Institute, um, I think is really promising. And in one of his talks, and I don't know, maybe I'm reading too much into it, but when Tom was saying, why are we going to be funding organic agriculture at this point? Um, to such an extent, and he was saying that he has a grandchild who no longer can have two servings of dairy um, in one sitting because he can't tolerate it. And that is, I think, a key part because as people see our children, which is it's 40% of kids have a chronic health condition. And so whether it's the kids or the grandkids, it starts to open up the eyes, even if you don't know exactly what the science is behind why we're becoming intolerant to our food source. I think it's also important to note that um, more funding and more support for organic agriculture has uh, come as big companies have started to buy up the big commercial non-organic companies have started to buy up the organic companies, um, right? You've seen a lot of that going on um, and they've been pushing for changes in the organic standards and that sort of thing. So I think you're seeing big food become more aware and cognizant of the consumer demand for organic and they're you know trying to take over that industry to a degree or be a big player in that so um, that's something that may be really good but it also may come with some pitfalls so something to watch um, on the organic side i think yeah that's true i don't know whether this week you had anyone from the real organic project um but they are a group that are trying to rectify that situation where it's the industrialization of organic agriculture. That's what you mean. Like, you know, because you can put those same practices to the point that Driscoll strawberries are grown on plastic in Mexico with cheap labor. I mean, that's not really what organic agriculture is supposed to be. And I mean, it's like the opposite. You think that you're spending more for, you know, this like, you picture a lovely field, you know, a strawberry field, but no, in fact, not. Yeah. Look, uh, Carrie, picking up on your your comment, um, uh, as we were closing out the the show yesterday, Jim ran, and uh, I ran out of time, but we posed the question to to Zach, uh, what is it, what actions can consumers take? Um, and so I, I'll, I'll pose that to the three of you. What are things that individual citizens can be doing? 
Yeah, I think, you know, again, I'm not an activist. I'm not trained in that regard. So I'm not very knowledgeable about the different tactics, but I know what I see um, that makes a difference. And, you know, what I what I see are groups like Kim Conte's group out of uh, California, non-toxic Irvine, I think is what she calls it. And they've just been going around. They started in their own community and they've expanded and um, they recently have been in communications with city leadership in the little suburb that I live in, in Kansas, um, just educating, you know, city council by city council and school district by school district, um, bringing these people up to speed on what these chemicals are doing to our environment. You know, why should you use them on school playgrounds? You know, why should you use them in city parks? And so you're seeing that all around the country, I think, um, local very, very localized uh, awareness sort of increasing and movement in that regard. So, I mean, I applaud that sort of thing. And of course, you know, do you choose what you buy, right? Do you buy organic food or do you buy conventional? Do you buy Roundup to treat the weeds in your yard or do you try to explore something else? Um, I don't know. I mean, I think everybody has a different risk reward ratio and a different perspective on where they want to, you know, invest or spend their dollars and how active they want to be in local politics or, you know, state or national politics. So for every individual, I think it's a different answer. Um, but you certainly have to have the information and be educated to, to make that decision for yourself. Michael, Kelly. I'd say there are little uh, cracks of light that come through uh, and uh, during the uh, trials up in uh, San Francisco and Oakland, uh, a Berkeley student was attending a Mackenzie Feldman and um, she was inspired to start uh, a group that was getting uh, pesticides off the campuses. Of, uh, of the UC campuses. It was uh, called Herbicide Free Campus. And she had students around the country and especially around California uh, going up and talking to the administrators of their schools and going to the actual uh, uh, guys who are uh, administering and spraying the, uh, the weed killers and pesticides on the campus and saying, hey, you know, this stuff is uh, not helpful to you. And there are probably other ways to get rid of these weeds that are, would not be dangerous to you. And she she was able to get the UC system to pause using uh, Roundup on the UC campuses. Uh, I don't think it's, I don't know if it's still the case that that's going on because they fight back obviously, but um, uh, she has developed this, uh, com this group called Rewild What's it called? Rewild uh, Your Campus. And uh, it's got high school students and uh, college students around the country doing things to just go interact with the people who are actually applying this stuff to their uh, community and do something about it. So there are like little fingers of light that come through all this uh, toxic soup that we're in. And uh, um, it's good to see that. And there, it is good that there are people with resilience like uh, Carrie and Kelly, uh, uh, Zach Bush, you guys that, that uh, keep, keep communicating and keep uh, uh, putting it out there that there is a better way to live. And I think you know, uh, one of the things that uh, I like about the way Jim starts his day is uh, with that breathing exercise, it's uh, get, you get yourself centered in a positive way to start the day. And from that center, uh, go out and do the right thing. And then each person that does that, it inspires someone else to do that. And, you know, eats organic, tries to introduce less toxins to their environment, influences their friends to do the same thing. Uh, I, I think that it's infectious goodness and uh, we should all practice it and kelly i feel as though i don't even really ha have to put in too much effort to be an activist at this point um just because my focus is is less on safe school play playgrounds and and parks but much more on the health side um and i'm the crazy friend of a friend 
that had health problems that now fights, you know, Monsanto. Um, and so I'm really considered a little bit odd in my community until someone's sick. And then they're immediately wanting to have, to have coffee with me, at which point I can explain the whole story. Um, and unfortunately, but not surprisingly, that's happening just, you know, every single day I'm getting a reach out from a new woman who has an autoimmune crisis of some kind and the doctors can't figure it out. This is just repeatedly happening. And I am hopeful because I spend time on Instagram as I see more and more posts exactly about toxin-free living and just people waking up to it because they have to, not because they're just, they just happen to be interested, but they're sick or their children are sick. So that makes it relatively easy to, to keep on being an activist. Um, another area that I really, really enjoy is the food as medicine movement, both um, in government, but also I work with Rodale on that, um, that project. And I was so inspired because this last fall I went to um, Pennsylvania and there was a program where uh, the local hospital, St. Luke's, had built a farm right on the hospital premises. And so then they could bring their patients the fresh organic food from the farm. And it's such an amazing model of what could be because I know here at Stanford, Lucille Packard Children's Hospital, like they're serving this red jello and like a hot dog to the kids that have cancer. I mean, it's so bad. And I think trying to break into that hospital system is, is a little tough. But on the other hand, you know, if you're out there and you are, you unfortunately find yourself in a situation that you're in a hospital, it's a great time to point out to people on the spot, whether it's your physician, the nurses, whoever it is, you know, this is why I'm concerned about that and start getting it into our medical system. So it's a little bit more in, in their vocabulary. Yeah, I, I received an email note yesterday from Katie, who was in contact with each of you to get you the, the Zoom link and to be able to uh, uh, give you the arrangements to join us. And she shared that uh, in, in Colorado, where she lives, she's been working with uh, the, the local churches to get them to convert a portion of the church lawn to, uh, to growing food for the parishioners, for the homeless, and for the, the communities that they serve. Oh, I and, love that. <laughs> That's awesome. It's those little things, you know, it can be big. Yeah, I think, uh, I think Zach uh, said yesterday that one third of all the land in America is used for lawns. Really? And it's just extraordinary. I believe it's that much. That's amazing. When we when we think about um, the amount of care and attention and effort that goes into growing grass, uh, the various chemicals and other things people use to uh, to maintain their lawns, um, and how that's just beautiful land that could be converted to uh, whether it's carbon sequestration or growing food or or other other uses beyond just something that we as a society have deemed to be uh, proper. Well, a, a question I wanted to ask the three of you is what what insights did you did you get from the week? What uh, what in particular struck you as as uh, new, different, uh, hopeful? Any uh, anything in, in particular you'd like to share with our uh, our audience today? But the one one thing that I enjoyed was uh, listening to Jim start uh the the meetings and the perspective of like uh, the the national perspective and international perspective with the political events going on that are pretty disturbing and uh bringing it down to uh centering yourself and uh doing the breathing exercise uh i thought was uh it was encouraging to see that there's other others out there that I wasn't even I wasn't even aware of you guys. So uh, it's a, you brought together a very interesting panel of people who are like minded about uh, doing something about this. And uh, so that's encouraging. Kelly, one thing I think that we all need to be careful of on this matter is 
I think that um, while I am actually a meditator and I too, I actually like this week downloaded the five, a 10 minute version of the five and a half second up and down. I was lying in the bathroom like, this is great. So I, I really enjoy all that, but there's a certain element and I love Zach. I've worked with Zach um, on a lot of projects, um, but I think that one has to be careful to universalize and celestialize so much of the problems that we have here, because while it obviously gives me, I don't know, some calm to see or to hear a beautiful speaker almost feel like, oh, thank goodness, you know, we, you know, ultimately the universe will save us. Um, I do feel like we have a responsibility while we're here on earth in this, why were we placed here? Like, why was Michael? Why was Carrie? Why are we right now talking here? I, I just have a personal belief that that was very deliberate. And I think it's important for everyone to realize that they have that specific place. And so what can, just going back to the last question, what specifically can you do while you're here with that understanding that there's probably more going on than we know? Um, what what can you do to make the measurable things every single day um, impactful? What can you do to be better and um, you know loving to other people and species that are on this planet right now? And so I, part of the problem that I have with the modern spiritual movement is I think that there's a lot of neglect to actual life when you're moving too much into that consciousness. So it's a, it's an interesting balance to try and try and weigh. Gary? But did I observe over the week or? Yeah, any any insights, any uh, anything that you took away from Monday's session or if you were able to, to see any of the other sessions this week? Yeah. I mean, I guess what's what's been on my mind when we talk about all of these things this week um, is just to remember that, you know, these are there's a lot of discussion here about politics and law and regulation and sort of big picture health and activism and strategy. But what it all comes down to really, you know, is is just every individual person, right? People who people are really impacted. Um, by these things. And a, a woman who I came to know through the roundup litigation, um, her husband uh, is a plaintiff or he died this week. He was a plaintiff, I suppose you would say. Uh, and his case has never gone yet gone to trial, um, never yet been settled. They were still one of the outstanding cases. And, you know, just watching and, and learning from that family in terms of what they've gone through the last seven years um, of getting non-Hodgkin lymphoma and trying to fight that and trying to be part of this court case, but struggling also to, you know, take care of his own health and just the toll that that's taken on this family. And then when he, he finally did pass uh, a couple of days ago and it just devastated that family. So, you know, these things that we're talking about in a very macro level, have a very um, intimate and, and personal impact on so many people. And I think we just have to remember that and recognize and respect that um, as well. You know, the people that Michael um, have has helped uh, through this litigation and the other lawyers involved is is really uh, is is really heroic. Um, so I think that we have to have to just remember the people who are really hurt by all of this. Yeah, one of the uh, one of the scientists on Tuesday shared that as a society we put money ahead of human life. Sure. And uh, you know, it, it's true not of just this this conversation and this topic we've been having this week around glyphosate. But we could we could make the same statement about pretty much everything that's going on in our society. And you know, here at uh, at Humanity Rising. Um, over the last two years of the broadcast, we've identified a number of issues that we're calling code red uh, issues. And um, you know, from for me, part of the inspiration for this week was really trying to understand how did we get here, and understanding that you know it's it's a very complex set of of um, problems that created the what we're dealing with because it's impacted our food system, our health system, our agriculture system, our political system, our economic system. It's not just a simple situation where a company created a poison that's being used to uh, to kill weeds. It's much more complicated than that. And so 
part of the, the desire was to really help our audience over the course of the week understand how, how genuinely, how did we get here? And the, you know, the, the, the um, program is, is humanity, humanity rising. And the purpose of the, the weekly broadcast and the daily broadcast is to help elevate human consciousness and help, help humanity rise. Um, but there is that very personal, that very real impact on, on people's lives in the society that we've constructed. And we're all both consciously and unconsciously contributors and participants in that society. And so part of the intention of the programs, whether it's the, the breathing at the beginning of each of the episodes or Jim's opening comments or the panelists are to help shift and elevate and, and help humanity rise. But we've got you know billions of dollars spent every year in advertising. We've got lots of companies um, and organizations trying to push their agenda forward that may or may not be helpful for for making that possible. And uh, so, you know, thanks to each of you and the voices and the messages you brought this week, it uh, it plants a small seed of helping to elevate human consciousness. And I'm just grateful for for each of you for what you've what you've been doing and um, and where you are in um, in making a difference in the way each of us attempt to to make a difference in the world. Back at you. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. Yeah. So I, I, I'm just curious. You know, we we talked a little bit about it, but. What what changes have each of you personally made in your life as you've gotten into uh, into understanding uh, glyphosate and the impact on our food systems? Uh, obviously, Kelly, you've you've had to make dramatic changes in your life because of the impact it was having on your health. But um, if if there's more you'd like to share, and and certainly Michael and and Carrie. Well, I just have really enjoyed learning more about the agriculture system by necessity, but now I find it fascinating, um, particularly some of just agricultural history and better understanding. Like I had no idea, for example, a large component to the fall of the Roman Empire was the power being taken from the small farmer. And you now see a duplication of that happening in our own country. And what does that entail? And then being able to go, um, because of what I've been reporting on and being able to visit what did a GMO farm um, look like? What do those farmers say about it? They seem like really nice people. Like why would they be poisoning us with these things? And of course that's not the way they see it. And just getting deeper into what the human experiences of that has been really enlightening for me. And on the side, I started volunteering on um, a regenerative organic farm um, local to me. And I just really enjoy physically being in the soil and better understanding what uh, soil biology is. So um, there's just something extremely comforting about being in nature like that and seeing just with so much pride what you can grow. And so I was <laughs> to, to like double down on being the odder one in my neighborhood. I um, pulled out most of my front grass and put in like large planter boxes. So I have like a mini farm going <laughs> in the front of my suburban home. and. Um, and then someone actually reported me to the city because that, you know, wasn't standard, I guess. And I, but I won. Um, so I'm allowed to grow food there, which is, which is nice, but I really take just a lot of delight. It's a new um, passion that I have. And so um, that's a big takeaway for me. How about for you, Carrie? Well, I don't have planter boxes <laughs> yard. Um, although I have explored trying to find a good spot in my backyard, which is not very big, and I'm not sure it would work out very well. But um, no, I mean, you know, I, I I think I've said this before, people have heard me say this, I, the fact that a bowl of strawberries can contain residues of 20 different pesticides, um, which I learned when pouring through the USDA and FDA pesticide residue monitoring reports that they put out every year, and if anybody wants to read them, they're public, um, they're terrifying. Uh, if you look at what the government knows about, you know, how many different 
pesticides are routinely routinely found in common foods, you know, fruits and vegetables and array of other foods that we're giving our kids every day. So, you know, my kids eat strawberries every morning for breakfast. So, you know, it's very important to me that they be organic. The same with the blueberries that we eat. You know, I've spent time seeking out local dairy farms where we can get milk and eggs and did a home delivery thing for a while. And then that seemed to be counterintuitive to the whole, like, you know, climate and having somebody bring me food to my front door. Is that a smart idea? I mean, so there's a lot of things you can just go down a rabbit hole, right? Chasing yourself around, trying to figure out what, what is the best overall strategy for me? Um, but yeah, I mean, we try to eat the, the foods that we consume a lot, the fruits and vegetables and things, we try to make sure that they um, have as little pesticide residue as possible on them. Um, and, you know, I've, I've done the battle in the yard with the weeds and thankfully, you know, because people know me, I guess, and know about glyphosate. I've had a lot of people reach out and say, hey, let me come to your yard and show you our new, you know, organic weed killer. So I've had people spray different mixtures of vinegar and things on my lawn and try to control the weeds that way. My husband and I in the summertime spend a lot of time digging up weeds. Um, although we've determined that I have an allergy to certain weeds in my backyard, which is not a good thing. So he does most of the digging up of the weeds. Um, you know, it's just <laughs> little lifestyle changes, I guess, that, that we've made based on what I've learned um, in these many years of research. And Michael, how about for you? Uh, I, in the past, had, um, hold on a sec. <laughs> um, wasn't very attentive to eating organic food. I um, had this sort of a joke about not being prejudiced against fast food, and I would eat it. Uh, and um, as a result of uh, doing a lot of the research on uh, glyphosate and Roundup, um, and that it uh, how it interferes with the microbiota in your gut and the relationship between uh, your microbiota and your overall health, and uh, that um, just led down this 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 uh, path of eating uh, organically, uh, making sure to have the the uh, uh, microbiota health, uh, advocating things uh, against toxins, doing more cases. Uh, you know, there's lots of toxins around, and um, we're still not done with uh, Roundup yet. Uh, but there's like heavy metals in uh, baby food, so we're litigating that now. Um, there's uh, uh, neurotoxins and um, uh, excessively immunogenic materials in. Uh, in vaccines and there's you know there's this third rail i guess of like uh, oh you cannot criticize vaccines but if you think about toxins that you ingest you have a system a, a, a digestive system that eliminates most of the toxins that you get exposed to especially if you have a healthy gut um but if you're injecting them that bypasses that system and there's an awful lot of uh um health consequences to having uh toxins injected um so uh generally speaking i've been more conscious of creating health uh and i believe almost i mean by the only drug that i take is advil when i like bang something boogie boarding or something and uh but um, and I advocate that and I try to, you know, have the work that I do within the law firm and I recommend that the cases that we do next relate to that. And I try to influence my uh, uh, colleagues who are also, you know, litigating things to do similar cases. And there are people out there that are doing those things and it's encouraging. It's also really discouraging that there's uh, corporations that can basically don't breathe and can stay underwater indefinitely and just keep 
generating uh, opposition to whatever we do. And it's um, uh, discouraging to see how much opposition there is to just doing the right thing. It, I mean, that, that one of the people posted something about uh, conscious capitalism in, I think, Brazil. Um, you can make money doing the right thing. And um, there is money to be made uh, creating and delivering healthy food that has good minerals in it and, it and it regenerates the soil. I mean, people can make money doing that. You can profit from it. Do it. I mean, there's you see in grocery stores now, it used to be you could only get uh, uh, organic food from like the hippies down that are, you know, out in the out in the suburbs. And now you can go to Safeway or to uh, Ralph's or, or uh, Pavilions, and they have a whole they all have whole sections of organic food. So people are, are wanting it, and they're recognizing the importance of it, and they can recognize that people can make money from it. Uh, I think we need to do things about decreasing the false profits of people of companies making money from making products without having to pay for the harm that it causes. It creates a false profit that motivates and encourages companies to do the wrong thing because they don't have to take responsibility for the damage that they cause. They leave that to the community to, to, to deal with. And I, I, if the more we can do to make them accountable for um, the damage they cause, the more likely it is that the, the company's shareholders and boards will be more motivated to find less toxic ways of living. It's a, a long process, but people like Carrie and Kelly and you are help, helping in that direction. Yeah, I hadn't I hadn't really thought about it. I mean, I was certainly aware of the dangers of glyphosate um, coming into the, this week, but I hadn't really thought about the business model that Monsanto created. And, you know, in, in business, people will oftentimes refer to the Gillette model where they give you the razor for free and then they make money on the, the razor blades. And Monsanto essentially did that in genetically modifying the seeds and then making money off of the, the sale of, of Roundup. And the, the farmers become completely dependent upon the, uh, the, the glyphosate because the seeds have been mo genetically modified. And uh, it's, it's an extraordinary amount of time and effort that went into thinking through that business model and figuring out how to make money. Um, and that level of creativity could have gone into, to your point, Michael, creating an alternative business model that would be beneficial for nature, beneficial for their customers, beneficial for society at large. Um, and it's, uh, it's unfortunate that our our economic systems have incentivized incentivized that kind of behavior, that kind of activity. Yeah, I, I completely agree. It is a brilliant business plan, however. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely brilliant. Uh, to just in perpetuity to to have that those products for sale. Yeah, uh, it is. It makes me pleased though to see that nature is out thinking that the GMO with um, now weeds are changing and, and modifying enough themselves to be able to, to um, sustain themselves even when sprayed with glyphosate. So that's great. But of course it puts you further on the herbicide treadmill with other more toxic things. And I think now GMOs have are resistant to five different herbicides. So, you know, littering even more, which is a big shame. Um, and I'm glad that you were talking about that, Michael, because I think in this discussion, a lot of times, um, there's a feeling of, is there a greater evil force um, at play in terms of, you know, Bear's history uh, in World War II or, um, uh, you know, uh, population control and a lot, there are a lot of theories that go around. I'm not going to say conspiracy theory because who knows they might be accurate, but I do think that the bottom line is that this was a money-making scheme that really went awry. And I, I choose to believe that when genetically modified seeds were created, that there was excitement just similar to what there has been for Impossible Burger, say, and actually it's dying out because people don't feel great when they eat it. Um, 
which is great. Uh, but I, I choose to believe that the intention behind it was just monetary versus um, ethically hoping to poison people. Well, picking up on uh, on Michael's comment, uh, Carrie, what what's next for you? <laughs> um, well, I've been spending a lot of time on paraquat, right, which is another weed killer, another herbicide, pesticide, um, and I and I'm still very much involved in following glyphosate and glyphosate science. Um, I, I'll give a little shout out to um, a new documentary film uh, called Into the Weeds. I think Kelly and Michael are both familiar with that, but um, it's really remarkably well done. And um, the filmmaker came to me several years ago, um, actually before my second book came out while I was still finishing it and and optioned the rights. And so built this film, um, the documentary on on the books and we worked together. And, um, you know, it's basically tells the story of that first roundup trial um, in great detail. And and with with Lee Johnson, who was the plaintiff in that first that first trial um, and the historic win. And it it really dives into all the things that we've talked about today, but takes you through Lee's very personal story, um, kind of much as my second book, The Monsanto Papers, which is which is Lee's story, um, and, and Brent and Michael and and everybody behind the scenes of that. But it's a great film, and they are um it's gonna be showing here uh in um, on Earth Day uh, in Washington, D.C. and different places around the U.S. And it's going to, uh, I think, in, also in April, debut in Brussels, um, Belgium. So I'll be over there uh, as, as a panelist, as I have been in some different showings um, with other people involved in the film. And, and, and it really is, um, you know, there are a lot of documentaries out there about these sorts of things. But this one, this is an award-winning filmmaker. Um, she it's very high quality and uh, they're involving, you know, legislators and others and really hoping that this film resonates uh, in a way that maybe, you know, a book doesn't or a webinar or an article, you know, to have to sit down with somebody for an hour and a half and really explore the very personal aspects of this. So I encourage people to keep an eye out for that uh, into the weeds and and, um, you know, I don't know, I'm talking about maybe writing another book, but I'm also thinking, God, no, <laughs> I don't know. it just sucked the life out of me. Those two books, you know, three or four years of my life gone, uh, time with my family gone. So I don't know. I may not be as resilient as we think I am. I might just be darn old and ready for retirement. I don't know. And Kelly, what's uh, what's next for you? I just am looking forward to continuing on what I'm doing and um, hopefully working a bit on Farm Bill 2023 that's coming up and influencing it um, specifically from the glyphosate perspective, because they're with a relatively small investment uh, from on the part of the USDA to farmers, uh, there are ways to dramatically decrease the amount of pre-harvest spray of glyphosate as a first stop. Um, so to, I mean, just... Oh, it drives me crazy when I think of just how easy this should be because they are able to farm without spraying Roundup on the grain beforehand. And it would, I mean, eliminate 80% or more of our dietary exposure to glyphosate. And so I just, I've spent a lot of time thinking, okay, what are the hurdles here besides, you know, it seems like an easy practice to spray and, and kill it. But other than that, and really it's a relatively cheap um addition to uh, their equipment that would allow them to go back to straight cutting. So I'm really, really hopeful that that somehow ends up in the farm bill. So that's this year for me. Well, before I uh, invite Jim back uh, to join us, any any other comments the three of you'd like to uh, to share about the week or your what you're up in, up to in the world or what what your experience was of uh, of our time together? Mm -hmm. I'm just very grateful that you put this together and that people like you are out there doing this. These events, um, you know, happen and, and can involve so many different people because there are, again, so many forces just constantly pumping out. You know, I was looking at this just this week from the American Council on Science and Health, which sounds like such a 
great resource for good information, right? Unless you know that they're funded by the agrochemical industry and other big corporations. But, you know, I'm looking at what they've put out just in the last few days, and it's just, you know, tearing down and trying to discredit all this different science related to pesticides and chemicals and PFAS and things that we know are um, so dangerous for our health. And here they are talking about how yeah, they're not so bad. They're fine. Don't worry about it. And and that gets pumped up and that gets elevated on Google search engines. And um, so you need places like this where we can, you know, try to help educate people and, and speak the truth to all of these powerful forces out there. One of the things that uh, that has been going on, like in the in as a result of um, uh, COVID and uh, some of the, and the Patriot Act, there's been a lot of infringement of uh, First Amendment rights, a lot of censorship, a lot of um, uh, preventing people from talking about things like this, or talking about toxins in vaccines, or toxins in uh, uh, food high fructose course, corn syrup. I mean, they're so, like uh, Kelly is saying, it'd be so easy just to stop spraying Roundup uh, to desiccate grains before you harvest them. How, it's not that hard. And uh, not understanding the connection between uh, that on Wheaties and Cheerios and Quaker Oats going into the guts of our kids and our and people in general, and how the mechanism that uh, Roundup uh, kills weeds is the same way it interferes with and kills microbiota in your gut, which is intimately involved with fat generation, inability to process uh, food properly, uh, um, uh, and interference with your immune system's recognition of uh, of uh, 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 carcinogenic materials that, that need to be attacked, um, mood. I mean, one of the things that uh, was interesting to me is that uh, there was a, a psychiatric convention while we were working on the trials where they had determined that uh, antidepressants, which I have been litigating against as like they don't outperform placebo for like 20 years, um, did the whole idea that uh, um, that there is a chemical imbalance it can be treated by a chemical that makes people feel better without recognizing that uh that the high fructose corn syrup the uh the uh, uh metabolic disorders uh the the dysbiosis those are things that are causing the conditions that make people feel cruddy when you feel cruddy you're not happy so you should be creating health instead of like treating the symptoms with uh, drugs that don't actually outperform placebo. So that was the subject of this, the, the American Psychiatric Association was, we've been treating these symptoms with these drugs that don't outperform placebo using a false meme of correcting a chemical imbalance and we ought to be addressing dysbiosis, ought to be addressing the microbiota. And there, I think people just need to keep speaking and keep hope up. And Carrie, I really applaud what you do. Uh, Kelly, I applaud what you do. Jim, it's awesome. This is a really cool thing that you're doing. Uh, they're little like pebbles thrown in the middle of the pond that uh, I hope uh, you know, permeate outwards and keep that, that vibe going. Thank you so much, uh, all of you. Um, I'd like uh, to underscore uh, what you just said, Michael and and uh, Kelly and Carrie, in the following way, because I I've been pondering uh, this question that you asked earlier, uh, Tom, about you know why are people doing this? I mean, why are you putting glyphosate on all the crops before? And to some degree, it's money. You're absolutely right, uh, Kelly, and I think there's also malevolence uh, in the background, but I, I'd like to raise another framework, which I think for me has been helpful in understanding why modern science is doing what it's doing. And it goes back to Louis Pasteur uh, in the 19th century, who, as you all know, kind of discovered 
germs. Up until that point, medicine didn't really have a, uh, an understanding of what caused diseases. And it was Louis Pasteur that identified germs and uh, developed the really the first vaccines, which were to injecting a kind of a poison in the system, starting with sheep that had anthrax, to try to cure them. And his great protagonist, which is really interesting as a model for our frameworks today, was a guy named Antoine Beauchamp, another great physicist and scientist of, of, uh, of France. And what he said was, this is completely wrongheaded. What you need to do is improve the health of the whole system, not inject poisons to counter a specific ailment or a disease. And they had great debates and it was great controversy uh, because Beauchamp said that, that disease is a very subtle interactivity of the whole body system. And if you try to pinpoint a specific symptom and eliminate the symptom, you're gonna end up poisoning the the, 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 the system and make the system less able to uh, develop the, uh, a holistic response. It's worth noting that after this great controversy, Louis Pasteur on his deathbed conceded that Beauchamp was right. That it was not the utility of science to go after a disease or a symptom with poisons that was the key to the cures that we seek and the human health that we all aspire to. But this notion of going after a symptom and going after a germ with poisons has led to the very structure of modern medicine. You see it everywhere. You identify a symptom, you eliminate the symptom. We saw with COVID, one of the reasons why we're the most chronically ill country in the world in the United States, we now rank 50th in the world. We're not only the least healthy of the industrial world, we're falling into third world status in the United States. We're one of the most diseased, chronically diseased populations in the world. Partly as Michael's point out, not only glyphosate, but the vaccines. But it's also, if you go into any hospital, they're attacking a disease and almost universally they use poisons. And we're now understanding, as Zach Bush and several of you have been pointing out, that that's completely the wrong way to enhance human health. The World Health Organization is an example of this. 30 years ago, the World Health Organization was helping poor countries around the world improve their water supply, improve their sanitation, improve uh, nutrition, uh, make sure that mothers had uh, healthy births and so forth and so on. Now, the World Health Organization is a dispensary for pharmaceutical vaccines. And if you look at what happened during COVID, there was no articulation by the US government or any government in the world that we could improve our body's immune response and our overall capacity to withstand uh, these uh, challenges like COVID-19. It was all about the vaccines. And so when a Monsanto, within the context of this scientific paradigm, looks at a weed, <laughs> they come at it with a poison because that's the way the paradigm has been structured since Louis Pasteur. And one of the reasons why there's this deepening antagonism on the part of official agencies um, against organic farming or against holistic health or against many of the supplements, because it doesn't fit into this prevailing paradigm. So anyway, as we closed out, our, our week, uh, uh, Tom and, and all of you, I wanted to bring that in because I think the transformation of consciousness that all of us need to engage in 
uh, is at the level of the basic paradigm by which we understand human ailment. And as long as we're caught into a germ theory, as long as we're caught into a, a response to germs that's, that wants to eliminate the germ, rather than, as Beauchamp said, just nurture the whole system. And if you empower the whole system by eating right and living good livelihood, et cetera, et cetera, we heard, the body will generally take care of itself. And if in the end that doesn't work, then you may have to apply certain remedies, but that should not be your first line of response. So anyway, I wanted to bring this in because it keeps bubbling up through the week, and I would love to have your responses to, to, to this point of view. Jim, that was so articulate that I don't even want to say anything after that. That was beautiful. That is such a perspective I haven't heard. I, I just really enjoyed hearing it. And, um, you know, I've seen similar um, writings out of, I think it was one of his seminal works um, with Wendell Berry's uh, Solving for Patterns. Yeah. Um, it sounds very similar. And I wonder if that was what it was derived from. So, um, no, I, I don't have anything to add because that was beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. But I thought I would just get, uh, get uh, you know, your response because you're much more deeply immersed in this uh, than certainly I am. Michael, what would you, you say? say that I agree uh, and, and I uh, echo what uh, Kelly said. That was very well said, Jim. All right. So I'm the cynical one. Very well said. Yes. But I guess as I was listening to you, I was like, gosh, but it would be fantastic, right? It'd be utopian. But, you know, I, I know a woman who took her kids and moved out into, you know, the countryside and bought a plot of land and and is growing her own food and teaching her children to work the land. And, and she has animals integrated with her crops and she's she's doing it all. And it's fantastic. And that would be my dream. But, you know, where I live and where my daughter lives, it, it matters certainly what we eat and it matters that we exercise and it matters that we try to live good and be good, but the air pollution, the particulate matter and the air totally. pollution, you know, that is so, and the water that we drink is so contaminated and, you know, it, the, the, the toxins that we put into our environment are so many and so pervasive. It just does seem really overwhelming. It, it certainly isn't the food, just the food. It's the food. It's the water. It's the air. Yes. It's the products that we use, you know, um, and I truthfully don't know how we escape all of it unless we all can somehow do what this woman did and <laughs> take our kids and find an uninhabited little part of the world to kind of try to, you know, refresh ourselves. But um, I certainly wish and hope that everyone could, could adopt the mindset that you've laid out. Well, and, just... And I, want, I just wonder if it's going to end up being survival of the fittest because we know our species is really at risk. I mean, is that where we are? It, the numbers would say that that's the case. Numbers would say that this <laughs> our population is dot like it's literally dying. It's not reproducing to the extent it used to. So are those people that move out going to be the ones that lose? I maybe <laughs> we're going to end the week of Armageddon, right? Like, yeah, we... totally. <laughs> no, let me, let me frame it a different way. Cause I certainly take your point, uh, Carrie, that we're in a toxic Soup. atmosphere. And that's why the bulletin of atomic scientists has put it 90 seconds to, to midnight. Absolutely. I think that because of the pervasiveness of the trauma that we're all in, one way or another, geostrategically, physically, in terms of health, in terms of the environment, nothing less than a radical transposition of values um, will suffice in the spirit of, you know, what Einstein said, that the consciousness that produced the problem uh, can't solve the problem. So what I think uh, I was alluding to is, is that as we look at the world and as we look up at how we navigate through the world, our emphasis, in my view, should be on how do we enhance our overall well-being. And I'm just reading uh, Gabor Mate's book, Myth of The Myth of Normal, which I would recommend to all of you. It's one of the most profoundly incisive books about human health uh, that I've ever read. And he obviously, as you know, from his previous works, looks at 
how childhood trauma and ongoing trauma affects disease, affects well-being, and corrosively uh, undermines our capacity to be fully human. And what he's saying in the myth of normal, uh, and this is one reason why it came to mind, this great controversy between uh, Louis Pasteur and Antoine Beauchamp, is, is a, a question of, of worldview. And what he points out is that however you deal with your childhood trauma, and we all have them that profoundly affect us, the single greatest mechanism for moving through that trauma and kind of coming out the other side is a sense of positive meaning in our lives, a sense of understanding our relationship to a greater whole. And you you saw that if you've read uh, Man's Search for uh, uh, Meaning uh, that came out of the uh, Auschwitz experience uh, in the Second World War, uh, that um, uh, he survived um, because, and others didn't, because he instilled within his soul profound love for his wife. He had just been married before they were condemned to Auschwitz. And he kept holding his wife in his heart and loving her with every ounce of his being. And he began to realize that his overall health began to improve. His capacity to think. And that was the great contribution that um, uh, produced the logotherapy, that, that it, is, it is the capacity of a human being under any circumstances to create a meaningful, positive vision of themselves and the relationships in the world that is the single greatest determinant in the overall well-being of us as an organism. And so I just wanted to bring this in as, as, as what's been a move, a moving, because you all embody this. In the face of what you're dealing with, you've been strong, you've been clear, you've fought the good fight and you've you know like michael's won a few <laughs> and kelly i bet you anything uh when you finish with the u.s congress uh the uh, the ag bill is going to be appropriately modified because of who you are so i'm bringing this in just as a way to acknowledge uh how inspiring you've all been uh in a week where we're teetering at 90 seconds because it's just filled my soul with deep gratitude for you. And I feel better. I feel stronger as a result of these five days. So I just want to thank you for it. And, and um, maybe since we're coming to a close, I'd love to hear just a final word from uh, each of you. Uh, then Tom, you can uh, round us up. But uh, Michael, why don't you go first and Kelly and then Carrie. But and it's really hard to follow that inspirational <laughs> speech. Uh, um, one of the things that uh, that I Kelly uh, showed you is I gave her the uh, Ram Dass's book "Be Here Now." Uh, uh, again, starting the day from uh, being here now that uh, um, allows me at least to um, not be. Uh, completely discouraged, like Carrie, by uh, all the crap that's going on and all the uh, corruption that's out there and all the toxins that are out there. Um, and to uh, have that sort of space uh, in my life to uh, do something to make a difference and uh, start from that center of uh, mindfully approaching life um, in my own way, uh, trying to be, like I said earlier, infectious goodness. Um, I think that uh, things that Kelly are, uh, are doing, is doing, um, is pretty incredible. And uh, to actually meet with uh, uh, people who are making the big, the big decisions 
uh, politically and legislatively is inspiring. So I'm really happy to see that. Uh, Carrie's, you know, continues to write. She's got some uh, uh, TV series things she's working on that it exposes some of this stuff. And she worked pretty, pretty closely with uh, Into the Weeds. Uh, and, you know, I, I I think that uh, programs like this that uh, teach you to start with the, the, the breath, uh, apprehend the, uh, the, that joy of now that's waiting for us to apprehend it. There's a, 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 a Tibetan Buddhist, uh, the Tibetan Book of the Great Liberation, Tibetan Book of the Dead had this sort of concept of uh, we're, uh, we're doomed because of our desires and, and um, suffering, but there's a definition of suffering that uh, is the failure to apprehend the joy of now. And um, if you can uh, recognize that it's there waiting for you to apprehend it and start from there, I think that's a way to live life. And so that's my final speech to the, to the crowd. <laughs> apprehend the joy of now and uh, uh, take those deep breaths and uh, st and be mindfully aware of what you do in life and things will get better, I think. Beautiful, Michael. All strength to you. Kelly? I just want to point out that, so Michael is one of the special people that I've met through all this and through his whole time um, in the courtroom and out, he has this... Um, really beautiful vision of life and how we should be treating each other. And I remember early on, he said, I don't like to say anything about anyone, or I imagine that the person that we're talking about is right here with us right now, because I don't like to say things about people at all, like that are negative or whatever it is. And it's just this constant, really, even, even against people that he's up against, <laughs> you know, for uh, legal in the court case, but um and so then it really was special for him to share that and the meditation and um, centering and remembering, okay, this is why we do these things. And, and the fact that he always has really pushed hard to, to release these internal documents so that we can all see what the corruption is. I mean, that's been invaluable for, for me, for Carrie, for any reporter and anyone that's just curious to learn about these things. So I just, I really thank Michael for all, for giving me that perspective. I really think of him as, as a leader in how we should be approaching these matters. Um, and uh, I just, and, and Pedro, I'm another guy who, who's one of the lawyers on the case. He and I have a little back and forth. We take um, videos of our gardens that we grow now because he also <laughs> has a front of your garden. <laughs> and I just, I am so thankful for the community that I've gotten with this. And this community is growing larger and larger as our eyes are open to this. And just that I, I go back to just having this time in the garden and really attaching myself to nature and directly interacting with nature, even in a small way, I find so meditative and just it it refreshes my mind as to why I'm working so hard towards this. And, and the final piece is that, and I think a lot of people are like this, I just, I really, really have a hard time sleeping when I know people are really struggling um, and suffering with physical ailments that they don't deserve to have whether it's cancer or, you know, infertility, I, the pain is so deep. And I think we need to be opening up our hearts and our minds to hoping for greater healing in mass um, because it, it's not their fault. Everyone's just trying to live their life. And it's just a few greedy corporations that have taken it away. Um, so, so, you know, we can keep on working towards this. And I do have hope particularly yeah, through through webinars and the work that you're doing and just having a forum to discuss these matters and come together is really important. So thank you. Thanks so much, Kelly. All strength to you too, as you take on the U.S. Congress. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. I need it. <laughs> Carrie. What they said, right? I mean, <laughs> um, again, I mean, I'm I'm just grateful. I'm grateful for this opportunity. I'm grateful for all the people that I have met um, along this journey. And you know, just being a journalist, um, when I've spoken about that or people ask me about that, I always thought I I never wanted to be anything else. I mean, from the time I was 12 years old, uh, because for me, it it's you get paid to learn about really important and interesting things and be a witness to history to some degree. And then and then your job is simply to share that right with other people. I mean, 
what other job is that wonderful and amazing where you're learning and you're sharing, which is what you're doing here today. And so I'm grateful for the opportunity and, and all the people that I've learned from and gotten to know. And Michael, you know, I just, I have to express too, I mean, how much I appreciate um, Michael Baum and the other people, you know, in his law firm and the others that I met along the way. Um, you know, Michael's a very special guy and I've, uh, he's a very, you know, well-off, powerful, intelligent attorney. I've met several like him who don't spend the time to do a webinar like this, who wouldn't spend the time to go to Washington, D.C. and schlep around, you know, very heavy documents and sit down with lawmakers to try to explain to them, you know, what is actually going on. Uh, he could ride off into the sunset with his great wealth and boogie board like all day long. Right. Um, but he takes the time to do this sort of thing and and. Kelly doing what she's doing. And so uh, I just, I guess my message is gratitude and and thank you everybody for being on this webinar and taking time out of your day and, and sharing, learning and sharing. That's what it's all about, right? Thank you, Carrie. Good luck with your next book. I know you're <laughs> hesitant, but we need you. <laughs> we need we'll that journalist to keep revealing the truth. So thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Tom. Um, I think I'll, I'll pick up on, a, on some of the comments that were shared by each of you. So, you know, the, the challenge each of us have is that we get busy with our lives. And um, a good good friend of mine several years ago wrote a book about the importance of being conscious and aware of what we put in our body, on our body, and around our body. And it's an extraordinary amount of work. Uh, as a citizen, as a human being, to notice and to pay attention. But that simple consciousness of what am I eating? What am I drinking? What am I putting in my body? What am I putting on my body in terms of skin care and health uh, hair products and everything else? And, and what's around me? And if we can just make a little bit of time each day to be conscious in our purchasing decisions, in our consumption decisions, um, it, it can shift. Um, and ultimately, it does come down to each of us as consumers about what what organizations are we supporting. And uh, it's, an, it's an act of protest in, in some ways. But it's not easy because we all do get just busy with our lives, the things that we determine to be important to us and priorities. So for me, it's just, it's such a gift um, to be able to host a week like this week and have the three of you and others who have been with us this week and to, you know, in, in some small way, hopefully it's it's making a difference in the world. And uh, thank you, Jim, for making that opportunity possible. Thank you, Tom, uh, Carrie, Kelly, Michael, thank you all so much. Um, let me conclude with a observation from Ursula Le Guin great science fiction writer that probably most of you have read. She had a statement in her later years where she said, you can't buy the revolution. You can't make the revolution. You have to be the revolution. If it's not in your spirit, it is nowhere. What we've seen this week is a group of people who have committed themselves to be the revolution. And I want to acknowledge that. I want to salute that. And I want to say that that capacity to be the revolution is at the heart of what humanity needs to embody globally. For us to push that clock now teetering at 90 seconds to midnight back so that we have time to remember who we most essentially are, that we are nature. And as we understand that, 
and align ourselves back with the very processes that gave us life. We will gain both the knowledge and the wisdom that we need at this critical moment to save ourselves and our precious planetary ecology. So thank you all. That'll bring us to a close, everyone. Brilliant five-day program, Tom. Thank you so much. You're all welcome to the after session chat group. You'll see the chat link uh, in the chat box that Stan's just put up. Have a good weekend and we'll see you next week. And next week, we're going to delve into another five-day program on the black male experience in America, which given what we're seeing in the news lately is another extraordinarily powerful domain of inquiry on humanity rising. Carrie, Kelly, Michael, Tom, deep gratitude. Bye, everyone. Gotcha.